Yeah. Hi. Um, welcome to See the People's Women Writers Fest. This is our year-end edition. And uh, today we'll be discussing the timeless appeal of Indian mythology and its ability to resonate with culture and generations across. To talk about this more, we have esteemed guests on our panel. Uh, first up is Kavita Kani. She's a former journalist and a best-selling author. Her seven novels so far have all based on women of Indian uh, mythology. The latest novel, Tara's Truce, is uh, about recounting a, a narration of Ramayana and is based on Tara, Wali's wife and the compromises she made to fulfill her uh, purpose, including marrying her husband's killer. Next is Rupa Rai. She's a children's author and a journalist living in Bangalore. She has over 20 published books, including the bestseller, The Gita for Children. Thank you so much, both of you, for coming here and uh, uh, having this discussion with us. So I want to... Uh, start with Kavita. Uh, you are a feminist storyteller with a keen eye on female warriors, princes, and uh, queens. Rupa, you also want to enlighten children uh, about understanding of Vedas and Upanishads and uh, how they can help us live a fearless life. I want both of you to uh, to you know, recount how you know what pulls you to the stories of mythology. What is this timeless appeal, uh, Kavita? You can start. I think that I think you, the answer is in the question itself. That it is because of the timeless appeal. You know, because these stories are universal, and most importantly, they are extremely relatable. You know, the yeah. fact that they are timeless and they are still popular is because they are relatable. You know, because uh, you mention any emotion of humankind and you will find it mentioned in the epics. Definitely. It's like whether it's love, jealousy, disappointment, intrigue, redemption, anything. Mm -hmm. uh, it's there. It's there. And so these emotions have been sort of trans transformed into stories. And you know they're, they're just not it's not one long story. There's a little stories which are interwoven into each other. And I think each story has not just a message. Uh, it's a story of our lives. So I think uh, uh, mythology, uh, uh, I personally as a writer believe it gave me a, it, uh, it provided me with a literary tool. You know, mm -hmm. I use it as a literary tool to say what I wanted. Uh, by with the backdrop of these very stories, these ancient stories, which are still relevant now, uh, which are still popular now, and uh, telling the stories which are very much uh, our, st our stories still, you know, because it's not the story of just, let's say, about all the eight uh, protagonists I'm talking about, whether it's Tara, Satyavati, Saraswati, Urvi. They are stories of us. You know, you'll find a Surpanaka, uh, Ahilya, uh, Tara in um, uh, you know amongst us you know it, they are they are our stories in the sense I mean I say these women these characters are extremely palpable in our daily lives you see them everywhere so it's just up to us to recognize them or not so I think mythology for, for, for me was a perfect platform to you know to tell ancient stories with a certain contemporary sensibility. Mm -hmm. Uh, I I want to come back on the relatability factor that you mentioned. I'll come back to uh, that again. Uh, Rupa, would you like to add? Uh, I don't write mythology so much as I do scripture, what can be called a scripture, I think. And it's it, while what Kavita said is absolutely right, we our stories remain timeless and they're interpreted through cinema through plays through uh, you know daily life all the time for about for i don't know thousands of years because they're universal stories and relatable stories but um, scripture as far as scripture is concerned i myself was very surprised to find how relatable the indian worldview is to the scientific rational outlook which we think is a 21st century thing or a 20th century thing we think science is a modern thing and uh, you know, scripture is some fuddy-duddy ancient thing, but really human nature remains the same. The human frailties remain the same. Human aspirations remain the same. And these ancient texts, they address those things. 
And Indian texts are particularly relatable to the 21st century and are timeless because they are not concerned about God. Many of them, you know, you would think of them as religious texts, but religious texts would center, foreground God, you know, most religious texts. Mm -hmm. But Indian ancient texts like the Upanishad, the Indian thought process, Indian philosophy centers the human being, not the gods. So it's about you. It's about finding that divine spark in you. It's finding the God in you, the God element. So it makes you the powerful person. Again, you know, a lot of uh, people think of um, Indian texts or Indian worldview as being fatalistic. You know, your destiny, it's already written. What can you do? Stuff happens. But in fact, if you go to the Upanishads, they tell you there is some scaffolding, of course, the birth, the families you're born into, the opportunities you have as children. Those, that is a scaffolding of destiny. But within that, you can be who you want to be. So in that sense, there's a lot of free will as well. And that kind of thing is very relatable to the 21st century. Everybody has thinks that, you know, science and free will, what is destiny? That's not true. And yes, so these ancient texts, in fact, speak your language. So I think that's what makes them uh, so relatable to whichever country you're from, whatever religion you practice, Whatever food you eat, what color of your skin, whichever age you are born in, these texts speak to you. Yeah, and um, this is something that you have mentioned in uh, the Gita also, that God lives within us. And yeah. if you want, you can find it to do better things. Uh, yeah. I, I want goal, to understand. The trust is to find that divine potential in yourself. Yeah, yeah. so I, I do want to touch upon that. I want to understand ki why is it necessary to create this belief system especially in children today because they are exposed to so much negativity we have uh, at at a touch screen we have so many things available so many resources available i want to understand this from you uh, why why do we need to have that divine belief system in with, within us you want me to answer yeah. that now or you want to come back okay so uh, that's what it is, you know, it's not, we think of it as this generation is suffering or something more than previous generations, but every generation has had its own, uh, you know, challenges. And this generation has, of course, this challenge of being overstimulated all the time because there's constant stimulation, which leaves you less and less time and opportunity to reflect and go inward and introspect. So in that kind of, in, so you feel very rudderless. Uh, you feel like uh, you have no hope. Plus, there is this dystopian kind of future being projected at you all the time, whether it's climate change or, you know, uh, wars going on, uh, things, uh, governments breaking down, ways of being being changed continuously, AI coming in, jobs being taken over. There is no place for humanity anymore. You know, this kind of constant fear mongering about the future. I mean, it may be very real also, climate change. I'm not saying it's a fake thing, but, you know, when you're surrounded by this kind of negativity and fear, it's very difficult to function. It's very paralyzing. And then you begin to say, what is the point of it all? Why should I even do all this stuff, right? If it's everything's going to end in 10 years anyway, what's the point? I might as So there's a lot of, um, your morale is very low usually, you know, that this kind of things, with this kind of thing, it's very difficult to find courage in the stuff outside of you. But that's why it's important to believe and for us to teach them and, for, you know, that actually your vast resources, your only resource of great courage and power is within you. It's not outside. You can look for it endlessly outside. You can say, oh, but you guys had a better life because you were looking hopefully to the future because there was hope in the future. No, it's all within you. You know, the universe, we carry the universe in our heads. It's not what is outside of us, but how we see it that makes. So in that sense, we are constant. Each of us carries a different universe in our heads and we can change the universe in our heads by just shifting our lens. And you can do that only if you believe that actually the power resides in you and it does. So once you believe that you are the master of your own destiny, it's much easier to be calm. It's much easier to say, Yes, now, you know, I can stop blaming others or feeling, oh my God, the walls are closing in around me. You start expanding yourself, I will break these walls. You believe you have that power. It's very important to have that self-love, self-belief, 
that is what is uh, not just for this generation for any human being anywhere it is that that keeps us going yeah yeah how lovely uh thank you uh kavita i want to come to you now uh in tara's true tara is a doctor she's resilient dedicated and she is not afraid uh when she stands up and says you know i want to be addressed as this in the very beginning when she meets the brothers also uh when you create a character in the books you you humanize them you make them relatable how difficult is it or is it a path that needs to be threaded carefully while doing so because at the end of the day they are uh, they are gods they are goddesses so uh, is it is it easy is it difficult how 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 do you see this as a challenge um Uh, if you are talking about Tara's too, they were not except for Ram. I mean, they were about. Uh, I tried to, in fact, uh, show Vali, Sugriv, and uh, Tara as humans, not as uh, mythological characters at all. In the sense, semi uh, semi human forms. I mean, they are when they are Vanars. I've tried to sort of disconstruct the word Vanar. You know, they are people mm-hmm. of the forest. They are not monkeys. You know, in the form of yeah. monkeys. So it starts from there. So whether they are. we are talking about that or whether we are talking gods and goddesses i think i have never written about a god, uh, the god except for saraswati and none of my books have got the gods and goddesses as the protagonist they are definitely there in the periphery but i think this humanizing uh, god is is what the ancient text is actually about you know when we are talking about these stories uh, or or the significance they are not stories about gods and goddesses or gandharvas and apsaras they are stories about man it are stories as i said earlier they are human stories about human follies human uh, uh, weaknesses human fallacy uh, human trust human trans so it's story about man human kind and the battle which he fights he or she fights uh, outside and within you know so it's a in- internal and uh, so you, this humanizing becomes very essential because you are not deifying them the moment you deify them they become there's an element of the uh, the idealist or the supernatural you know it's something okay above uh, it's not mortal the very fact that it is mortal means that it is in your it's within human bounds and with the human bounds it comes the human weaknesses you know what 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 man is about so no uh, where taras uh, where taras too was concerned tara it was so i tried to show tara she is a physician's daughter so she sort of takes on the trade of a father uh, again then you know she is her entire character arc from being a physician's daughter to being uh, the wife of an extremely powerful man who become a self made powerful man called wali and then becoming eventually becoming sugri's queen so the entire where she as a role as a woman the play, the role of a woman she plays in their lives you know so whether she is the woman who t- supposedly started a war which is a very convenient way narrative to have or uh, the woman who even patched up a war you know that's why i brought the other tara also in the story the tara tara goddess where we are talking about tara brihaspati and chandra which is a more dramatic story rather than uh, than this tara so where i've tried to the, the the conflict of both the taras was the same they became sort of prize trophies which had to be won by the men warring men so the men the war was definitely not started by the women it was because of the man because of man his power his greed his sense of power where women were actually used as a trophies nothing else so this humanizing factor actually became most in saraswati uh, let me my uh, last book where uh, uh aish uh, because saraswati is one goddess who is extremely non conventional she broke all the rules she did not endorse marriage she did not endorse motherhood which are the two very pillars of uh, the definition of a woman so when i was writing about saraswati uh, yes i was a little scared about you know making her she is not just the goddess of learning she is the goddess of uh, art and music she is goddess of everything creative so her humanizing her like we are talking about creation creativity uh and how much of it as man do we appreciate this knowledge and the creativity which we have in us and how much are we using it 
to our to the best potential we have all the information we have all the knowledge but are we using it wisely so there i was it was more on a very metaphorical level where we are talking mm-hmm. about saraswati uh, <clears throat> as when we are talking about her talking talking about her as a goddess i think i was more interested in her as a woman because she is one goddess which we see alone we never see her as a couple you see shiv parvati you see lakshmi mm-hmm. narayan but you never see saraswati and brahma together the creator and the creativity you know if you actually see but that marriage has not happened why why has that marriage not happened you know because she herself she is completely strong and uh, let's say um, strong in her solitude you know because her uh, this thing uh, the whole identity is extremely individualistic so humanizing saraswati yes was difficult and i was a little scared about the reaction but i think the readers took it well i think I, they got what i was trying to say that you know that entire fear like she was just talking about the dystopian world we are talking i think she is the most overlooked goddess we have and what would happen like the saraswati river has i think i start the book that way that saraswati river has disappeared and at the end of the book is what actually saraswati disappears from mankind what if mm-hmm. knowledge goes away from us Again, what will happen to man? Will be will be reduced to barbarians anyway. So you know that sort of a that was the dystopian world I tried to show where if we do not value the inf- uh, the knowledge which is given to us and we do not use it wisely, I think we are going to uh, to uh, we are going towards the path of destruction. Yeah, that's that's so true. Uh, Rupa, would you like to add anything? Because time and again you have also re- uh, retold this that. the geeta was a conversation between two best friends and that was the easiest way to explain children also so would you also like to add uh, anything to this you you are on mute ah uh, yeah no, sorry so i always say this when i talk to children actually sort of that because they are all so familiar nowadays urban children reading children in some of the more icsc ib kind of school and cbsc as well they read a lot of greek mythology because there's been one uh, particular series by rick riordan called percy jackson series which i'm sure you also probably read right yeah very very nice books so and you know i can i tell them that rick riordan can do what he likes with the greek gods right he can take them from the top of mount olympus he can put them on top of empire state building he can say that's where they live now because america is the center of the world you can ha- take all these liberties when you talk about the greek gods because nobody is worshiping them anymore the greeks are now christian so you can say what you like but in india and particularly uh, when you're talking about something like the geeta you know it's a living breathing text very beloved to a lot of people and a lot of people uh, feel very deeply about it and if you treat it lightly irreverently irreverently or even if you don't even if you treat it with the utmost respect but you interpret something in a way that is not palatable to a lot of people like um, kavita said it you could get into a lot of trouble and not because people hate you or people are awful or anything but because it means something very yeah. deep to them. and i came to the geeta i mean really i wrote it as you must have seen in some of the interviews i must have said this and the book came out in 2015 even in 2013 if you had told me i would one day write a book called the geeta for children i would have laughed you know appropriately because mm-hmm. that was not on my agenda at all it was not on the plan of my life i i thought you know i thought of myself as a cool writer who wrote adventure and fantasy and maybe science and stuff like that but uh, not not scripture like you know because i didn't have that kind of reverence for the geeta because in my family it wasn't there uh i had uh, of course mythology indian mythology loved to bits but the geeta those kind of texts i hadn't really focused on growing up and so when when my editor was like no no come on why don't you do it this is my editor called watsala watsala called vanuji at heshet india and i was like i think you picked the you got the wrong man i'm not the person for this job i don't know enough about the text i i i have and i had a lot of misconceptions about it that it was meant for old people and you know you must have passed through the busy mm-hmm. of your life the ups and downs and then when you're in the winter of your life when you're getting closer to death then you read the geeta to feel comfortable you know these kind of misconceptions and i had no idea whether it was going to be patriarchal highly religious casteist 
uh, sexist, you know, I said, no, I don't, I don't think, why would I burden children with this was what my first reaction was when she said, why don't you do this? But for some reason she persisted and I said, okay, I'll give it a try. Let me read the text. And then when I started reading it, I was completely mesmerized. I was riveted. I said, this is nothing religious about it at all. It's just a self-help book for the world. And it's the oldest self-help book probably. And it comes from India. And because it comes from India, there's a lot of resonance. But how do you uh, uh, teach it or how do you get children to be interested in it? And then when I thought about it, uh, one of my aunts who was taking me through the Gita said, and you know that Krishna and Arjuna are best friends. And I, actually that had never occurred to me in that, in those words. I had always thought of them as, you know, the Gita Upadesha visual is always Krishna with his hand up in mm -hmm. blessing. And Arjuna collapsed on the floor of the chariot kneeling. So I thought it was some kind of devotee um, and devo uh, devotee and God kind of relationship or a mentor mentee at best. But I realized that actually they were very, they were just the very best of friends. They spent so much time together. And then I said, ah, okay. So it's basically the Gita is a conversation between two best friends. Never mind that one is telling the other one to stand up and kill his family. You know? But actually, it's two best friends, and that gave me the entry point. Uh, and you need something like that, some kind of hook to, especially when you're talking to children, to make it relatable to them that, you know, this is your story. And who is this friend? Who is this best friend that everyone wishes they could have, who always has your back and who knows what's right for you? Well, he's nobody but you, your higher self. Your, lo your lower self is Arjuna when you're confused by your emotions, clouded by thoughts and fears and anxieties. But if you can somehow move those aside, and consult with your own higher self. Uh, so you don't have to feel that, oh, Arjuna and Krishna, I don't have. You do. Your job is to get in touch with him or her or it, whatever you want to call it, and then find a way through the Kurukshetra of life. So once I got that thing, then it became easier to talk to kids about it. Yeah. Yeah, what a lovely perspective I thought. Uh, so now I, I want to come to both of you. Uh, this year we have seen in flux of uh, retellings we have had in in pop culture we have had adi purush we have had ram setu prithviraj and so many this prithviraj chauhan so many retellings um, so do how do you look at the landscape of indian mythology is it changing evolving going back to where it was like what what are your future outlook uh, perspective on this thing any one of you can start. Okay, I mean, uh, personally, I believe there's a different audience where books are concerned and where uh, the visual are concerned, whether, whether yeah. the cinema or the serials. I mean, it's completely different. So I think I'll stick to books. I think uh, the reader audience is definitely extremely... Uh, I think the reason why uh, one of the, 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 this uh, retelling the star of these texts is popular is because there's a huge, I think, void in the sense uh, there's a lot of curiosity because they don't have anyone to tell them these stories anymore. You know, earlier there was someone telling these stories. These, so I think one of the reasons why this genre has become popular is because of this enormous curiosity which the, and I think Gita is doing a fabulous job of, uh, Rupa is doing a fabulous job of uh, uh, telling it, you know, starting from children itself. Because when I when I meet my readers, most of them are young and they really want to know the, all these stories. You know, it's like they say, oh, is it genuine? I said, I always tell them, go back to the original stories. You know, that's yes. so important because what we are interpreting or reinterpreting is our POV. And it has the very reason why these stories are still there after so many thousands of years is because of the retelling. Yes. I always believe that because of the interpretations and the retelling, these stories have survived thousands of years. You see, she was, yeah, Rupa was talking correctly about Greek mythology. We are talking about Greek mythology, but it's dead. Mm -hmm. For us, these stories are palpable, are right from music, dance, our names. You know, each one yes. has, you know, everything. I mean, we are living, we are living in our uh, stories, these very yes. ancient texts. So I think uh, it's such a huge legacy, it's such a rich legacy, and I think it's 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 really criminal if we we as our own people we don't know what it's uh, and I think uh, when uh, when the readers ask me uh, I think why telling these stories I think I I think I think Rupa and myself we are doing a little bit of sort of letting them know what you know the depth and the richness of these stories I think uh, 
uh, what is very important here is that all these stories don't make you judge you know they are not judgment they are, it's not about morality they are not moral lessons at all they have a very strong philosophical content which i think uh, urges the reader the, the audience to think not think. judge basically to think to comprehend and not judge i think the stories i think because of patriarchy sexism whatever they have become judgmental stories this whole thing of black and white you know the good woman yeah. the bad the bad woman the, you know you don't have the whole thing of a, especially the characters of sita and ahilya if you see mm-hmm. uh, or even shakuntala they have been completely they have changed the original mm-hmm. stories were not like that at all so i think when you go to these original stories you realize it it was definitely a more uh, free and a liberal world creatively you know where each one could watch the thought and and i believe that every interpretation every interpretation every retelling of the story was an example of uh, freedom of choice of expressing your views they saw ram in a certain way they saw ravan in a certain way they saw gandhari in a certain way they saw krishna in a certain way and all these stories went on because remember all these stories were basically oral storytelling they went on added up and then the script came and yet it was getting reinterpreted and uh, revised and revisited and i think it became richer every time and all i think the the, the audience has to do you are talking about the future i think the audience wants to know more and more i am i'm very cynical about cinema and the way these stories have been interpreted in cinema and serials very it's very sad they are the most powerful media, uh, exactly. media. Yeah. And they do not they don't just they do not they just want to add drama to they do not have to add drama they are dramatic itself you don't have to add your i mean i remember the way they sort of completely butchered my one book by adding they are anyway sas bahu series they are like any sas bahu they are stories of daughters in law and mothers in law but by putting it in their your regular format you are, you know you kill the story i mean the see the way the mahabharat the, the new uh, epics have been retold in cinema and uh, mm-hmm. i'm completely disillusioned i mean sorry to say but considering the you know the potential or the power it has to co- communicate and to influence this thing i think they are not doing anything i mean absolutely they just want to go in a completely uh, comfortable template mm-hmm. and say ha ah, these are the stories there no there's no interpretation they are not there's no i don't i don't think they are taking in the wisdom of the stories at all they're just showing yeah. an aspect and a, you know they're just showing it as stereotypes which what i mean Mm-hmm. I mean, you're not doing the Valmiki and Vyas the justice at all, honestly. Yeah, so, I love it when you. Yeah. I have more respect for readers' audience than let's say. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. I really liked when you mentioned that we are living in our own stories. Yeah. That is such an elegant way of putting up, and we need to respect that legacy also, which was left by our ancestors. Uh, Rupa, would you like to add on to something? Yeah no I think she I think Kavita hit the nail on the head when she said that we are, the stories are meant to make us think not to judge mm-hmm. at all because morality is, belongs to the age it changes with every age it's not a it's not a good plank it's not a stable plank to base your base your stories on because then they won't stand the test of time because morality what is good and what is bad that interpretation changes with time and geography and uh culture and everything but these are timeless especially because they do not judge and they are not moral they're not saying this is right this is wrong they are offering perspectives and you know in the upanishads there are those four um, mahavakyas the great pronouncements and one of them is aham brahmasmi i am brahman brahman is the name the upanishads gave to that divine cosmic energy that exists all around us and inside us and everywhere so but if you go to the root of the word itself in uh, sanskrit brahmasmi the the root sound is brah which is vast large you know and that is what these stories do they enlarge our minds we cannot live so many lives we are living one life but through these epics through these stories through itihas we can pretend to be we can see things from uh, so many people's points of view and what does that make us not the limited beings that we think we are but it expands our minds it makes us god we can absorb everything if the, what is what is the nature of a god or a superhuman being someone who can see every point of view 
And uh, this is a way for us to see different points of view. And the fact, like Kavita said, that we are allowed to play with it. Every writer is, a, is, is an acknowledgement of every person as a unique individual who sees things from a very different point of view based on his own upbringing, her own circumstances, her learnings. And if you go by Indian philosophy or belief, then from the samskaras that you have gathered in previous lifetimes, all of that determines how you look at a thing. And instead of just shutting down certain voices because they are not the voices of your club or clique or uh, it doesn't somehow suit you to listen to them, if we allow all wise voices to flourish, then only we can become, we can get closer to the potential of being God. You know, we, we hear all voices. And that is, that's why even the Gita, you know, it really doesn't, it, you interpret it as you like. There is no one person interpreting it for you. you. And that's why even I, every time I go back to the Gita, I get something else out of it. Based on my own circumstance on that day or what I've been through in the past month or how I have changed as a human being or what new experience I've added, I look at it, I get new learnings. And that is, our stories exactly as Kapka said have flourished because we have been allowed to reinterpret them and retell them according to the needs of the age yes. and the culture to find new lessons in each of them and again come to the conclusion that actually nothing's changed at all you know the world might have changed utterly utterly since the time of these epics but actually nothing's changed at all in the internal landscape so, yeah and i think that answers my next question also about uh, is it possible to breathe new life into this age-old archetypes because we have the uh, uh, freedom to play with it like Rupa mentioned that we can interpret it in our own way and uh, play around the characters and understand the lessons from it. Um, I, I want to uh, ask how was your reading year, how has the reading year been of 2023 and are there any recommendations for our, for, for our readers, for our viewers? Uh, from your favorite reads of 2023? Me, I, unfortunately, I, I have not read very much this year at all. I've been busy and uh, busy in the sense of when I write a book, when I have to write a new book, then I get, I only read the stuff that is connected with that because uh, this year, the, my book, the Yoga Sutras for Children came out. So it has to be a very immersive because I didn't know anything about the Yoga Sutras at all. So then I have to read, listen to discourses and stay in that space for a bit uh, to be able. So I, I just get into that space for a long time. But and when I just want to get out of that space more than reading, because I have been reading all the time, I watch some, you know, OTT stuff uh, rather than read. That gives me <laughs> relaxation. So but having said that, what have I read this year? Let me see. I have really enjoyed uh, this one. I'm a, I don't know if it's come ulta or whatever. Amartya Sen's uh, autobiography. It's not, they're not new books. They're just books that I've bought and bought and kept and kept and never read. But this year I read this, uh, Amartya Sen's memoir. That was lovely. I really enjoyed this book, Nora Efron's I Feel Bad About Men. <laughs> like really funny feminist read, really cute. Uh, and then, of course, books on Hinduism. And then I read this other book, which is also nice by, by a Bangalore writer called Chandan Gauda, another India collection of his essays about all kinds of things about India and Karnataka. So, yeah, things like that. I'm sorry, I have nothing um, to say. I just read what I can, when I can. But next year, 2024, I promised myself that I will spend some time reading just for pleasure, not for work. Any shortlist you have prepared for uh, 2024? No, yeah, I'll just see what happens. You know, I mean, when I have the time and when I want to indulge, I just, I always pick crime fiction. I just love yeah. it. Yeah. I, I, I don't remember anything the next morning, but it, the page turns. <laughs> They're fantastic. So, so that is my reading junk, like junk reading is that, although they're hardly junk, I mean, I would love to craft a beautiful crime yes. mystery novel. <laughs> I haven't done so, but but those are what I enjoy. So I don't have any list, but but I will soon, maybe in 15 days, if you ask me. I'll have. <laughs> Lovely. I, think, I think it's ditto sentiments. Uh, I think by the time you finish doing your research and reading and rereading your book, I think you're so exhausted. 
Yeah. Uh, and I have this very bad habit of going back to the same authors. So same. I'm, stuck, I'm stuck in the group. Like I still, for me, the comfort, my this thing are mom and Buddha. So I keep going to them. Oh. And um, like I feel anything, I just read a short story of mom. You know, that sort of a thing. Correct. So because, you know, honestly, I don't think I have the patience to read uh, test out a new book and all if I don't like it or something. So unless it's been, I've got 100% reviews about it, you know, good reviews, I will not touch it. So for yeah. me, it's like, I don't want to, whatever time I have, whatever time I want to read, I'll I'd rather go to, my, you know, it's like comfort food, it's a comfort authors I have. Yeah. So mm -hmm. these are my four or five authors, which I really love. And I keep going back because I think it's like um, discovering and rediscovering them, the character. No, sure. Like Graham Greene, and I mean, not all mm. these authors are really, really, or an Aldrich Huxley reading his essays, you know, and especially Aldrich Huxley, which has very strong Indian connection and his connection with philosophy, and you know how he could think of all that so many years before, and how he realized the worth and the value of it, and we did not. So you know all these sort of things. Uh, so at, as an, there are no new recommendations at that. I just go back to my old books and. Uh, yeah. Um, in fact, I, I just went I hope I hope I change next year. I keep saying no, I'm not to read new author, but you know, it's really exhausting reading your own books. You know, by the time you finish editing, it's like and as you said, uh, my other love is cinema. So whatever time mm -hmm. I have, I love watching. I I think I watch one movie a day, or at least some serious uh, OTT. Like I love uh, Scandinavian noirs. Oh, same, same, same. I love and, <laughs> and uh, crime thrillers. I love reading crime. I love chase. I love Raymond Chandler. I love all these. Of course, Agatha Christie, I went there. I think it's right there in my bedroom. So I think anything happens, I just, even if you read two, three chapters of it now, you feel it's, yeah. it's, it's also nourishing your nostalgia. I think it also yeah. happens. It's also that. And, hmm. you know, what you thought when you read the book first, you know, it, that also is a revelation for a writer. Yeah. What uh, mm -hmm. uh, even as a reader, you know, what you read a book the first time and then you read it the fifth time. I think you you realize you have evolved yourself yourself as a writer and as a reader. So I think it's very important that you go back to your books. I would like to end here with this note that comfort is the best uh, thing we can find in our stories in ourselves. Uh, thank you so much for this lovely discussion and uh, yeah, all the best for New Year and Happy New Year in advance. So yeah, thank you. Happy New Year, Ragini. Happy New Year, Kavita. Happy thank you. Year. Lovely interview. Enjoy happy new year. Yes, happy new year to all of you. And uh, yes, uh, uh, of course, the resolutions will come. But I think one of the resolutions is please read our books. And secondly, on our part, we'll read, we'll read new books also. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I would request uh, both of you to send me a profile photo for the social okay. media creatives. So, and we will just push out the creatives tomorrow. So, yeah. That is one request.